as she said, I did my graduate work at NC State and I'm now a Master Gardener volunteer. Um, and it's true that I'm an entomologist. That said, I use as few pesticides as I can get away with. Um, but I, I don't like being bugged by mosquitoes any more than anybody else. So why do they bite you? First of all, only females bite because they have to get a blood meal in order to uh, mature their eggs. Uh, and what are they keying in on? First of all, they, from a distance, they key in on carbon dioxide, which all mammals breathe out. And then as they get closer, they notice a dark shape and they notice your temperature. Again, it says to them, mammals. And then some uh, mosquitoes actually key in on lactic acid, which is interesting because it's probably a coevolution with human beings because other mammals don't drink milk after they are babies. But finally, what we notice is that some people are far more attractive to mosquitoes than others. And, you know, I can be working out in the garden all day long and not be bugged at all. And my husband will step out there for five minutes and he is nailed. And the reason is that he has different skin microbiota than I do. The bacteria on your skin produce volatile compounds. And the bacteria are largely from your environment, but there's a genetics plays a part in which bacteria thrive on you. And some people are just, I guess you could say, sweeter than others. Let me see if I can, whoa, there we go. So mosquitoes breed in water and many, especially the Asian tiger mosquitoes that a few people have talked about are plaguing us at this time of year. They breed in small puddles and they travel only a very short distance from their breeding sites. So it's really important to control their breeding sites if you don't want them around you because they're not gonna come from far away. So uh, this is a picture of mosquito larvae. Notice that they're hanging upside down at the surface of the water. This is how they breathe. They have little siphon tubes and they come up and they take a breath. Um, they live for about a week or two in water depending on the temperature, the warmer it is, the faster they develop. And then they only last a day or two uh, as uh, adults. Well, let's see if I can do the next one. Here we go. So the most important part of control is controlling breeding sites. Empty saucers under your flower pots. Be sure your gutters uh, are empty. And also if you have piles of flower pots or, or pails or anything like that, watering cans, be sure you do not leave them with water in them because if you do in a few days, you're gonna have larvae breeding. And this is a mosquito dunk. Um, you can use them in rain barrels, you can use them in ponds. They are safe for the other organisms living in the pond. Basically, it's, uh, it's Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. It's a slightly different form than the one that we use on caterpillars uh, that are eating our vegetables. But what it does is it interferes with feeding. Uh, it prevents their feeding. Now, another thing you could do if you have a pond is you can get mosquito eaters, but Gambusia are not native to North Carolina. So if you get them, do not let them escape into the wild. Okay, so you've done everything you can to control their breeding sites. Now you still need to keep them away from you if they're around. First of all, I wanna talk about yard sprays, which are well promoted by the industry. They are not recommended. First of all, they are broad spectrum pesticides. So they're killing everything out there. They're not killing just the mosquitoes. And they're targeting the mosquitoes where the mosquitoes are hiding out in the shade during the day. But they're, they're only killing the adults. So it means that you have to have repeated applications if you wanna have your yard free of mosquitoes all the time. If you're gonna have a party 
and you think, well, I don't want my guests to be bugged, you might think about using one just before your party, but I would not recommend uh, using them generally because they do just, they kill the predators and the uh, pollinators and everybody else. Fans are a really low tech way to keep in mosquitoes away from you on your deck or on your patio. Mosquitoes are really weak flyers. So if you just set up a fan and have it sort of blowing at you, the mosquitoes cannot fly upstream to you. So it will keep them away. Uh, and then there are various repellents you can use uh, to keep them away from you. Some are for around you and some you would put on you. And as we know, there are lots of choices in repellents and sometimes it is uh, difficult to know what, what is your best choice. So there are spatial repellents um, and these keep mosquitoes out of an area. However, they do not really prevent them from biting you. Uh, citronella in candles and lanterns um, reduces mosquitoes by about 50 percent. Um, uh, it's been around since 1882. Uh, Coils, uh, which are pesticide burners, uh, they are pyrethrum or pyrethroids, um, were developed in the late 1800s. They are also very effective, but you should not, you have to use them only outdoors. So what's happening with these um, materials is that there are volatiles that are being released that are acting as repellents. Uh, people have been hanging bruised plants or burning plants in their homes for thousands of years to try to keep away pests. And still people make a sort of a stew of um, herbs with lots of volatiles in them uh, in underdeveloped areas uh, as a way to control mosquitoes at home. Then, then we have contact repellents. These are ones that you either apply to your skin or to your clothing. And they work by interfering with the mosquito's detection of you because their, their volatiles they are evaporating and they mask your volatiles. It's called vapor toxicity, although it's not really toxins as you're talking about generally, but it's talking about repellents. Uh, and Although they will keep them uh, away, it doesn't mean that you won't have them buzzing around you. I'm sure that you've been out and if you're in a lot of mosquitoes, they're not landing on you, but boy, you can sure hear them. So Louise, I have a couple of questions in the yeah. chat. Um, and so Carrie, I know you talked about the, the BT, the bacterium um, and the mosquito dunks. Um, is uh, interfering with their ability to digest food. Is that right? Yeah. It, and so are they harmful to amphibians or other insects that might get? No, Bt is extremely specific. Matter of fact, the Bt that is used on caterpillars doesn't work on mosquitoes. So it only works on mosquitoes, the Bt that you get in these mosquito dunks. So interesting. And um, and Kate wants, um, she wanted to be reminded why, why do females need a blood meal? Uh, because they won't have the nutrition to develop their eggs without getting a blood meal. There's just, they just don't have enough energy. You know, just as if a, uh, a woman were pregnant, she has to eat uh, and she has to eat well. Uh, mosquitoes have to eat well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that, uh, um, what I have two small children and, and um, my doctor told me that I need to make sure that I get lots of calcium while I was pregnant because like my baby would literally just like suck the calcium from my bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, mosquitoes are on the same page. Only no doctor tells them. They just, they, they, they don't yeah, get a blood meal. They don't develop their eggs. Right. And so um, another question, um, you mentioned that, you know, mosquitoes are attracted to specific um, you know, carbon dioxide and maybe lactic acid. So are more people 
more attractive. And you said your husband was very attractive. I know my children just get eaten alive by mosquitoes and I won't have a bite on me. So, um, well, so it could be lactic acid, although I don't know specifically about Asian tiger mosquitoes, which are our biggest pest right now, whether they're keying in on lactic acid. But they are keying in on the uh, biota on their skin. You know, whatever bacteria is on their skin, they, those are fi they're finding them very attractive. Yeah, and so do you know if, um someone's asking this blood type have anything to do with it do you know not that i understand and i and i i will talk about later whether you can eat things that help you keep them away the answer is no but i will talk about that a little more specifically in a bit yeah and i know that our um one of our labs at the museum actually did a study about um you know if there's a correlation between skin bacteria and um, attractiveness to mosquitoes and mm -hmm. you know, trying to do these correlations. Um, so it's interesting that you And there are. The, the studies first came out in 2017, so it's pretty new information. I mean, yeah. we always knew some people were more attractive than others, but we didn't, re I didn't really understand why. Yeah, and then um, last question before we move on. <laughs> um, so Jerry said he has never seen the larva in his bird bath. Is it because of the chlorine? Well, in his bird bath, he probably changes the water out frequently enough that they don't. Remember, it takes a week in really warm weather or two weeks in cooler weather for them to develop. Mm -hmm. So you won't even see them for the first three or four days. And then they'll be large enough to detect. And you'll see them, they sort of go squiggle, squiggle, squiggle across the top of the water. Um, uh, if you haven't seen them, lucky you. Uh, but I don't have them in my bird bath either. But my bird bath is it has a constant drip in it, so it's the water is always changing. Mm -hmm. And of course, the birds do plenty to sort of disrupt it too. Yeah, that's a that's a good point because I was just thinking that, you know, I went outside um, this morning after the rain and dump, you know, was dumping out all the the areas. I had to empty my um, turtle tub, it's literally a tub in my yard, um, because it had hundreds and hundreds of mosquito larvae in it. But my, uh, bird, bath, my bird bath, which sits kind of underneath um, the edge of the roof of my carport, and so the water splat, I think, just cleans it out every time it rains. <laughs> and, yeah. so, uh, and so, yeah, I keep looking and waving, like, are there larvae in here? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and, so, and the water's nice and crystal clear. So. Um, I think, yeah, just the constant changing of, uh, of that water out. And I know they don't like necessarily like moving water, which is why you'll find them in puddles. And right, right. They, they want still water. Now, a lot of insects live in, in uh, streams, but not mosquitoes. Mosquitoes require still water. The so moving water and wind keep them away as larvae and adults. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So moral of the story is move fast. <laughs> All right, I'll let you move on. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, of all the topical repellents, DEET is the one that is sort of considered uh, the repellent against which all other repellents are compared. It was first developed in 1946 uh, by the U.S. Army, uh, became available to consumers in 1957. So this has been around for a long time. Um, the CDC does recommend its use where mosquitoes carry disease. Um, and uh, I should mention that uh, 10 to 30 percent works uh, quite well for 7 to 14 hours, providing you're not sweating it off or you're not washing it off. But more is not necessarily better. There are, there have been some tests showing that over 30% does not improve efficacy. And there have been some cases of neurotoxicity with repeated high doses, um, where low doses show no toxicity at all. And it is considered safe for children. Um, uh, it does not smell very good. And if you have used it, you may have also noticed that it can damage plastics and rubber and vinyl. But it is considered very safe, provided you use it correctly. Let's see if I can switch to the next slide here. Here we 
Well, wrong direction. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so there are other uh, topical uh, repellents that are also not plant-based. Picaridin was developed in the 80s. It was uh, used in Europe, it's been used in Europe for a long time. It didn't get to the US until 2005. Um, but it does show some skin irritation with it. Uh, the same thing with IR3535, which was developed in the 70s, again, available in Europe before it was available here, still not readily available here. Permethrin is a pyrethroid. Now, this one actually is a toxin and not a repellent, and so you should only be using it on clothing. So uh, if you are in heavily mosquito uh, infested areas, particularly if there are diseases, you're like you're in the tropics, it's a good idea to use it on clothing, but don't put it on yourself. And you shouldn't actually put any insecticide on yourself under your clothes, because under your clothes means it's, it's staying up against you and it's not able to go out and do it, to volatilize for the insects. Um, so if you're wearing clothes that you think that they will bite through, like a light t-shirt, you can spray your t-shirt, um, but you shouldn't be putting it on your skin except where your skin is bare. Um, and uh, another um, chemical used is this 2-eundecanone or BioUD. It is uh, very similar to a compound found in tomatoes and strawberries and cloves. Uh, and, but again, it can be a skin irritant. So <clears throat> we like the idea of uh, botanically based uh, insecticides because uh, repellents, because first of all, they smell good and we think of them as being safe because they're natural. But natural doesn't necessarily equate with safe. And you know, when I I did some work with aphids and I used uh, nicotine, which is the most naturally occurring <laughs> plant toxin around to kill insects. So just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's safe. Um, I was given a bottle of uh, a homemade repellent by a friend of mine who was making it. It was this lovely little bottle, it was blue, and it was there were these essential oils in there mixed up with various stuff. And I put it in the cupboard and I took it out and the blue inside the bottle was digested by whatever was in there. And it made me a little leery. Um, it, when I was preparing this talk, I got on the web, I wanted to see what kinds of things people were recommending for making these uh, essential oil insect uh, uh, repellents. And this one was kind of cute. The person said, this one you can make in a minute. And I looked at all these ingredients and I thought it's gonna take you a long time to just assemble your ingredients. But anyway, I want you to notice that most of these ingredients are either considered skin irritants or are carcinogenic. Um, neither one is, is what you wanna be using. Um, whoops, wrong direction again. Let's see if I can do this. Okay. <clears throat> Um, now, because these essential oils are highly volatile, they, they, that means they evaporate very fast. So you have to be applying them every couple of hours. And um, this is a list that came out of Malaria Journal in 2011. You will notice, uh, first of all, I want to mention that this reference and uh, a number of other references are going to be provided uh, by Carrie. She will email everybody who's, uh, who's listening in on this talk the list of references. But I want you to notice the potential problems. Some of these that are being used as, insect, as essential oils to repel insects are toxic or carcinogenic, allergenic, or uh, skin irritant. So it's not without its risks, especially since you have to keep applying them. Now, there are some botanical alternatives, and the best we have found so far is oil of lemon eucalyptus, which is either called OLE or PMD. Um, it's, uh, a, it's dis it was discovered as a distillate waste product 
uh, from the essential oil, which was being used in perfumes. But one of the things that's so good about it is that it evaporates very slowly, so it lasts. And uh, it is, I should note, the only plant-based insecticide that is registered by the EPA. That said, you don't want to go out and find an extract of oil of lemon eucalyptus, buy it in a manufactured product, and don't use it straight. And it is also not recommended for people under three. And the reason it isn't is because it hasn't been tested on people under three. Um, neem oil uh, is a highly effective insecticide on plants. But if you apply it to yourself, it can cause some skin irritation. Bite blocker is another botanical. It's a blend of soy oil and vanillin, oils of coconut and geranium. But a lot of the studies have had very mixed results on its efficacy. And speaking of efficacy, this is um, another reference that you will have uh, information about. If you notice that in the middle you see skin sations, uh, which is a um, is has a number one. That is that they've said, okay, a seven percent deep solution. We're going to rate it as one. Then there are, then there are chemicals that are better, and there are chemicals that are worse. So they looked at a number of insecticides, and they found that if you go up from seven percent deep to 15% deep, you get only 50% more uh, control of mosquitoes. Bite blocker uh, in, in this test came in about the same. Repel, which is this uh, oil of uh, lemon eucalyptus, actually rated better than anything else. And if you look at the ones below skin sensation, skin sations, you can see that uh, many of these were botanically based. Um, and not particularly effective. So we do have some other choices. <clears throat> um, I, my brother is a fisherman and he's all into these little buzzing um, pest repellers uh, that he wear it on your belt. It turns out there's no, uh, no study shows that they actually work. Uh, bug zappers may make you feel really satisfied when you hear somebody getting fried, but you're frying, you're frying bees and moths and all beetles and all kinds of things besides mosquitoes, and it doesn't effectively control the mosquitoes anyway. People have applied fabric softeners or body lotions, uh, such as Skin So Soft. Now, body lotions might work for teeny tiny insects like noceums because they have teeny tiny mouth parts, but mosquitoes have larger mouth parts. And so a, a lotion is probably not going to be effective against a mosquito. And then here's the thing about whether you, what you eat makes a difference. People have tried vitamin B1 and garlic and brewer's yeast. Um, and, you know, garlic may keep your friends away, but it's not going to keep away the mosquitoes. Um, also, I have heard that people say you shouldn't eat bananas around mosquitoes because that's an attractant. Well, the smell on bananas is the smell that a bee, a honeybee, leaves on you when she stings you. So that's telling her, her colony mates to come and get you too. So you don't want to eat a banana in front of a beehive. However, you can eat as many bananas as you want in front of mosquitoes. It ain't gonna matter. <clears throat> so, although plant-based um, botanicals are environmentally expensive because of the energy and materials required for distillation, they may well provide a, a, a living for small-scale farmers. Um, we still have a lot of research to find good, long-lasting, safe botanical insecticides. Uh, you know, there's a, a bio mining, I think they call it. Um, I do want to mention, though, that no botanical oils uh, need to be registered by the EPA. So uh, this means uh, buyer beware. There's nobody who's testing this and saying that it's safe. 
so also people talk about, well, can I use plants as repellents in the garden? And we do know about companion planting bib. Why it works is again, there are volatiles that some plants produce that smell bad to some insects. Basil smells bad, although we don't mind the smell of it. Marigolds, I don't know of anybody who likes the smell of marigolds. Wormwood, tansy, uh, santalina are all examples of um, plants that have been used in companion planting to keep insects away from plants that you are trying to grow. Um, there are a number of insecticides that are available that are from plants. Pyrethrin is probably the best known, uh, is highly effective and non-toxic. Pyrethroids are synthetic pyrethrins. They're, somebody has just manipulated the formula a bit and come up with something which has better longevity or something. They are also considered non-toxic. Neem oil works against insects, but again, you want to put it on plants and you don't want to be putting it on you. And the two, undecanone that I mentioned uh, as a possible insecticide also <laughs> repels uh, cats, dogs, and rabbits from your, from your uh, plants. Uh, and I do want to mention that another thing that I alluded to before is Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a naturally occurring fungus uh, and the Bt that is used against caterpillars is, is very uh, effective and is considered organic. Of course, Bt is also what are in genetically engineered uh, plants to keep away uh, caterpillars without having to use any insecticide and uh, get a lot of non-target organisms. So Louise, uh, speaking of the, the last um, repellent that you talked about that will keep away some mammals, I'm curious to, to know if it to will- To eudecanone? Yeah, the, yeah, eudecanone. Will it keep away um, deer as well? I, I Not anything that I found. I don't know anything that keeps away deer. I mean, I put up an eight foot fence. <laughs> <laughs> They're hungry, they're hungry. Yeah, yeah, they're, and, and uh, like a lot of things, the insects as well, now I'm talking, speaking of plant feeding insects, a lot of plants are considered less desirable. However, if an insect is hungry enough, it will eat almost anything. And the same thing with deer, they're not supposed to bother ferns, but if they're hungry enough, they'll eat your ferns. So yeah, I, I say that same thing about my husband with chocolate that I can't even keep like baking nibs because if he wants it, he wants it and he's going to eat anything that has chocolate. No, no, no. <laughs> so, so when we're talking about, um, sorry, talking about plants, um, Marianne was asking, um, what about the berries and leaves of American Beauty Berry? Um, do they have any kind of um, I did not find anything about them. Uh, I know that there are a lot of folk remedies. My husband thinks that um, uh, heart, uh, not heart's western, um, um, jewelweed or um, uh, jewelweed is also called uh, touch me not. Uh, he says if you get poison ivy, you can smear it on you and it and it gets rid of your poison ivy itch. Um, uh, there's probably information somewhere out there about beauty berry, but I have not seen it. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. I just said, I don't know that it does. Right. And um, Jerry wants to know what the, do you know the source of 2-eundecanone? It is a synthetic. Uh, they found a chemical in these plants and they said, geez, I wonder if that works. And they manufactured it. So it is like what is in strawberries, cloves, and tomatoes, but it is not the same chemical. Awesome. Did I answer that? Um, Sardé was asking about the No No CM brand, and I quickly looked it up. I don't know if you um, looked it up, but it looked like it was a blend of um, lemongrass oil, citronella oil, and something else. So I imagine that it would be much in line with um, what you were talking about of those. Um, essential oil blends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, and I don't, I don't know if it's specifically, although there, there was a consumer report that was produced uh, this last July 
and they listed a whole, and I don't have it with me right now, but they listed a number of uh, insecticides and looked at them and most of the botanicals did not test well. Um, and of course, oil of citronella is, can be a skin irritant. So you have to take that into account. And some people are more sensitive than others too. You know, one person's skin irritant may not be somebody else's. And any insecticide repellent should not be put around your eyes because that will really, could really smart. And uh, I use um, repel oil of uh, lemon eucalypt, the lemon eucalyptus, this one. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it smells great, but you don't want to put it in your eyes. Uh, you know, you don't want to have it on your hand and rub your eyes because it will smart. So, uh, so um, I want to try to hit some key points. Um, first of all, your number one strategy to is to keep mosquitoes from breeding nearby. Um, this is, you know, be vigilant about where you have standing water, uh, empty flower pots, use mosquito dunks if you have things like uh, rain barrels, <clears throat> and you have to replace mosquito dunks. They do dissolve, so you have to keep uh, putting more in, but they're, eas they're easily available online or at uh, hardware stores. So it's not an exotic item, but be sure to get the mosquito dunks and not the BT for caterpillars because it will not work. Um, and that speaks to the specificity issue that this really is key to mosquitoes. So low grade control, use a fan. I mean, they work. You can also uh, burn these little coils. I don't frankly like them because I don't like the smell of them. Um, uh, don't do them indoors. Uh, citronella candles or citronella torches can also work. Part of it depends on how much pressure there is. I mean, if it's been raining and it's really moist everywhere, you're going to have more mosquitoes. So, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of mosquitoes, some things will be more effective because there aren't that many to chew away. Um, Topical uh, repellents vary tremendously in safety and uh, longevity and uh, efficacy. So you, you want to choose something that is going to last on you, that is safe, and that is effective. Um, and finally, I just want to say that companion planting does, can work to deter insects in the garden. Uh, and there are a number of botanically based insecticides for natural control. And that's it. Now, this is the first page of my references, which uh, and, uh, at the bottom you see the Consumer Reports July 2020. Uh, and then there's a second page of references. So uh, they, these will be sent out by Carrie to everyone who is listening to the talk. So that'll work. And I guess I'll stop my screen share. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Okay. And thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any, anybody have any other questions? I know that um, I have um, Thermacell. I don't know, maybe other, somebody mentioned Off Lantern. And mm -hmm. so I know that Thermacell is just, did a quick Google search on what it actually is. It says it's an allothrin, which is synthetic version of naturally occurring repellent found in chrysanthemum flowers, which is um, also where pyrethrin comes from. Yeah, so one of those P words mm -hmm. <laughs> that all sound so similar. Um, and I have to say that I do not use it very effectively. <laughs> Oh, somebody said they missed strategy one. I'm going to see if I can go back. Oh, uh, yeah. Strategy Hold one. On a let, me, let me get back to strategy one. Ooh, right here. Uh, and can you, do I, I have to do a screen share, I think, don't I? Yes. Okay. Hold on a second. Um, I'm not as slick on this as I could be. 
um, screen, oh, start screen sharing, okay, right here. Okay, do we see this? Yeah. Okay, so um, strategy number one is basically to, um, <clears throat> to uh, get, get mosquitoes before they become adults. Uh, get them when they are larvae, prevent larvae from developing. So you can do it by reducing uh, the places where, where larvae develop, uh, such as uh, in gutters. Gutters are actually a big one for uh, a lot of people don't think about it, but you know, you get your gutters partly plugged. Whoops, I just, uh, and, uh, and you get water standing up there and it doesn't take much. It does not take much water for a lot of these mosquitoes to develop. Um, and of course, pails, buckets, et cetera, like that will be great spots. And use, uh, use mosquito dunks where you do want to have standing water, like in your rain barrels or your pond. If you don't have mosquito eaters, which you don't want to release into the general environment. So I can imagine that strategy one, you know, I agree that it could be like the most probably the most effective strategy to keep them down in your yard but you know as we live in a society where we're especially in Raleigh there's lots of neighbors close by right and so if my neighbor has you know a giant puddle in their yard and you know breeds <laughs> thousands and thousands of mosquitoes how far are the adults traveling to find well um Asian tiger mosquitoes only travel between five and 10 meters, which is not much. That's like, you know, a giant step, um, 10 giant steps, that's it. Wow. So if your neighbor's puddle is 10 giant steps away from you, you don't have a problem. Now, the mosquitoes that we see earlier in the year um, can travel farther. But generally, the, the, these that are being played by right now are not going very far at all. Yeah, and I think, the, yeah, every time I see a mosquito, it, it's definitely an Asian type of mosquito. Yeah, and, and everybody has probably heard, knows how to distinguish them there. They have these sort of black and white bands. You see the stripes on them. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good sized mosquito, too. Yeah, yeah. A, a, easier to smack them out of the air. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any more questions? So what you're saying pretty much is all of her mosquitoes are totally her own fault. <laughs> all, all mosquitoes what? Are totally, like, so Carrie says all of her mosquitoes are her fault. Uh, uh, well, it could be, it could be. I mean, uh, we were visiting friends and they were being plagued and we went around and emptied all their saucers and everything and two days later, it was a miracle. <laughs> so it does it does make a lot of difference but you do have to be vigilant you know and you get a rain and even in the crotches of you know if you have trees that where you have a little crotch at the bottom or something there may be water standing there what do you do well you can fill it with sand uh, uh that's that's a possible way to fill up places that do tend to hold water uh, fill it with sand or dirt. Uh, otherwise, you know, if it's really standing, if it's lasting standing water, uh, consider using mosquito dunks. Okay, that answer is a, sorry, I had a question about, um, they have a ditch that constantly has water in it. Well, if it's moving water, it shouldn't be a problem. If it's stagnant water, then you do have an issue. And um, I should mention that I showed you how the larvae, let me see if I can get to this page here. Here, they breathe with these little siphon tubes that go up to the surface of the water. Now, one of the things that my father-in-law did during the Second World War was he had kerosene soaked rags and he threw them into ponds around his house to control mosquitoes because the kerosene formed a film over the of kerosene or some other oil, formed a film over the top of the water and the mosquitoes suffocated. A little soap in a uh, bowl of water will do the same thing because it destroys the surface tension. 
So mosquitoes have to hold on when they're up there with their little siphon tube at the, at the surface. They actually hold on depending on the surface tension. So if you put soap in, in the thing where you have water standing, you will also prevent the mosquitoes from being able to survive. They'll suffocate. That's an interesting point because I know that my, um, you know, my family, they, they kind of live in the country and it, they've always said like, oh, it's, take some Dawn dish soap and mix it with water and spray it all over your yard to get rid of mosquitoes. But I guess it's really just like sprayed in a standing puddle that you... <laughs> right, right. And actually, I probably use a drop or two of it in the standing puddle, but it can work. I mean, it's, it, it wrecks the surface tension. So that's, a, that's another, if you can't get rid of the standing puddles, you can go out there with your dish detergent and put drips of, of but you'll have to slosh it around to be sure that it, it sort of mix, mixes, mixes through. But you need a fair amount of soap to actually, I mean, depending on the size of the puddle, you know, in a little saucer, you don't need much soap at all. But if you've got a good size, you get something five meters across, you're gonna need a lot of soap. And we did have a couple of people asking about um, the plants you were talking about um, that can be a little bit of a deterrent. Um, but you oh, know, the companion planting. Companion yeah. planting right. Um, and so they were asking, let's see, um, like if they're companion planting, should the plants be on um, the patio where they're sitting or? As close as possible. Remember that unless you're actually burning something and creating smoke, you know, like in a smudge pot, or you are crushing it, you, your volatiles don't travel that far. So people plant basil in between their tomato plants. They plant their marigolds right in the, amongst the plants that they wish to protect. So you can't have them five feet away, 10 feet away. You gotta have them two feet away. Hold the basil plant in your lap in your <laughs> yeah, yeah, and your tomato plant in your lap too. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Ella is asking. Uh, she says she sees a lot of larvae in her pool, even though she covers it. And you know, I imagine it's because mosquitoes are very tiny and they um, can just squeeze into tiny. Usually, a, a pool, a, a swimming pool has circulation. And so you shouldn't be getting mosquitoes surviving in it. Also, of course, you use various bromine or chlorine or something like that. So mosquitoes ought not to be managing. But if you put a cover on your pool during the winter and you get this puddle, uh, you could be in trouble. Um, so if you can't get rid of that puddle, you might want to either throw in a mosquito dunk or use some detergent. You'll have a little bit of soap, but that's won't hurt anything. Awesome. And I think that might be it for the questions. Um, and so I, I, we have one more about companion plants. Um, Lena is asking, do companion plants help against mosquitoes specifically? No. No, no. I mean, I sort of, the first time I started looking at these, my daughter-in-law was wanted some lemon geranium plants and she wanted them on her patio to keep away the mosquitoes and I said I don't think this is going to work and I started doing a little homework then and uh, if you're crushing them so that the volatiles are released and they're right around you you know like you're sitting there and you're crushing them in your hands it will work but having them sitting in a pot a few feet away from you is not going to produce enough volatiles to make a difference. So get a, if you're sitting on your patio, invest in a fan, right? <laughs> invest in a fan. A fan is, you know, they're not, you know, they can be not too terribly annoying. I mean, I was providing you don't have it on super high and, and it doesn't take much breeze at all to uh, keep the mosquitoes away. All right. Well, with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna shut it down. Um, Louise, thank you so so much for um, 
giving this presentation today. I know that when I reached out to you and asked you if you had something like this, I think you like did not say so you did lots of research for us. And um, it, it, it was fantastic. Like I said, I learned a ton. Um, I know that I have been kind of making some of the mistakes that you pointed out about things that are not effective. Um, and so I'm excited to move forward in my life with like the best knowledge I, I can. Yeah. Well, but, you know, it is also a stay tuned because um, people are doing more research into botanicals all the time. Right. Uh, but I would say with that caveat, look for something that the EPA decides to look at and approve because uh, if, if the EPA has not looked at it, you don't know about whether it's safe. Right, and safe for us and safe for you know, other organisms in our environment that we yeah. don't want to um, harm or repel. Right. So, um, very I mean, that said, yard sprays are, per, are, yard sprays are considered okay um, because they're using chemicals that are considered safe. But do you really want to be killing all your pollinators and your predators? I don't. I don't either. And um, yeah, every time a neighbor puts up like, we're spraying our yard, there's always somebody, some other neighbor like, you're killing my bees. <laughs> and, and like you said, mosquitoes fly and they come back and it's not taking care of, you know, possibly the source, which is the larva. So, um, right. so definitely something to keep in mind. And, and yeah, check out the resources that we're going to send you guys. Um, all of you in the, we'll email it to you. It'll be from Carrie. So, you know, keep an eye on those resources and learn as much as you can before you, um, you know, make some of these decisions about, about repellents. So, okay. And of course we have, this is just the first day of Bug Fest and we want to see you for as many of these presentations that you were able to come to go to bugfest.org, check them out. We actually somehow are still updating um, that website. So there might be new things popping up um, throughout the week. So just keep an eye on it. And with that, I'm gonna share this with you. Of course, um, Louise mentioned at the very beginning, we do have bug fest shirts. Look at all the amazing colors you can choose from when you pre-order your bug fest shirt, or you can get a free one by joining or renewing your membership to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And um, if you enjoyed this talk, if you are enjoying BugFest, we, you know, would love your support um, via donations, and you can just donate by um, going to naturalsciences.org slash donate. Thank you again, Louise. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at another talk this week. Okay, bye-bye.